Yi Fan Li, the publisher and editor of Orientations Magazine. Welcome to our third lecture series with Asia Society Hong Kong this year. The topic today is collecting Asian art in the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. And we bring to you three distinguished speakers, Michaela Pejahova, curator of the Chinese art collections at the National Gallery of Prague, Isabella Kopania, who is assistant professor at the Institute of Art, Polish Academy of Sciences, and Jorgi Fizak, director of the Forensic Policy of the Asian Arts. Beginning with this year, we will devote one of the six annual issues of Orientations uncovering a region of the world. It was a great pleasure to work with Miguela as our guest editor to highlight collections in Eastern Europe. Next year, we will focus on Iberia. Before we start, we are honored to have the Consul Generals of Hungary and Poland join us with brief introductions to the art and culture of their countries. First is Dr. Pal Kertes, he's CG of Hungary, followed by Mr. Alexander Danda, the CG of Poland. Thank you. Dr. Powell? Thank you very much, first of all, for this kind initiative from you. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning in Europe. Um, first of all, I would like just to give you a brief introduction on Hungary. With a population of nearly 10 million people, people Hungary is a medium-sized country conveniently located in the heart of Europe. Hungary has been Hong Kong's largest trading partner in Central and Eastern Europe in the recent years. Hong Kong is our fourth largest trading partner in Asia region after China, South Korea and Japan. Last year, the total value of our merchandise trade with Hong Kong was 1.6 billion US dollars. On top of all said advantages, Hungary is a beautiful country with over a thousand years of history, rich culture and architecture heritage, diverse gastronomy, and Abman tourism resources. I am proud to say that in the, in the capital city alone, we have nearly 20 art or applied art museums of various disciplines. The National Museum, the National Gallery, and the Museum of Fine Arts are housing collections of outstanding national masters, antiquity, worthy new old masters from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, classicist, and early modern masterpieces. Private collector established Ludwig Museum has been the mainstay of both international and Hungarian contemporary works. Interestingly, we also have a museum dedicated exclusively to East Asian art, the Ferenc Hope East Asian Museum, bearing the name of the man accumulating the largest collection of objects of East Asian origin and offering in the Hungarian state after his passing. I think Jörgy Fajcsák will talk more about this. Not far from there, located at the Rausch Villa under the UNESCO World Heritage Site, Andrashi Avenue, is a new highlight in the Hungarian Museum scheme in going to open its doors in September this year. Q Contemporary will be a uniquely specialized gallery showcasing contemporary artists from Hungary and Central and Eastern European region starting from the second half of the 20th century. According to the 17 plus one countries, according to the Belt and Road Initiative, founded by Queenie Rosita Lau uh, from Hong Kong. And we are very proud of this um, museum, which is going to open very soon, um, officially this September. So thanks again, Ivan, for, for having me and having all this um, Zoom conference meeting. I think um, all more details will share Georgi she has been to Hong Kong already twice. We made um, two fabulous exhibitions with her from her museum. Uh, and I really do hope that uh, once the border will open, we can, we can collaborate with her more in the coming years. So thank you very much. And I'm listening to you. Thank you. Mr. Alexander, would, would you give us a brief introduction? Thanks so much. Uh, I just hope that my internet connection will be good enough uh, because I, I'm having some uh, problems with the stability of the connection. So, uh, uh, with much, much further ado, 
participants of the webinar. It's a, a great pleasure showcasing and celebrating the Central European connections with the culture of China. My special thanks for this initiative goes to Mr. Yifong Li, the editor and publisher of Orientations magazine, for your enthusiasm and in pursuing the the not so obvious road of uh, cultural links between China and uh, and Poland. As the representative of uh, the Republic of Poland uh, in Hong Kong, it is my duty and pleasure to bring Polish culture to the people of uh, this uh, great city. And uh, that is what uh, we in the consulate are constantly trying to do, even though those pandemic times uh, are making it uh, definitely more difficult uh, for all of us to participate in person uh, in cultural events. Poland is uh, full of surprises when it comes to cultural landscape of the country. Uh, the first name that comes to mind to combine Poland and musically the other works of Ignacy Paderewski, a famous statement, Paderewski, world's famous contemporary classical music composer, Stanislav Moniuszko, with his operas performed in Polish language, uh, probably in order to show to the world that uh, in the 19th century, the spirit of Poland was still much alive. It is in uh, Poland's former capital, Kraków, where you can get face to face with uh, one of the masterpieces of Leonardo da Vinci, the picture, the lady with an ermine. And uh, as opposed to your visit to Mona Lisa, you will not be disturbed by thousands of other visitors. It is in Poland that uh, you can visit the underground uh, World Heritage Site Vierichka salt mine, full of sculptures, chapels, chambers, and uh, underground corridors measuring hundreds of kilometers, all of those made of salt. It is in Poland that you can visit the world's famous museum of posters, as Poland is also world known for its famous poster school. Mm, one of the many cultural surprises that uh, Poland offers to the world is the question that uh, I suppose we are going to learn the, the answer to the question today. How come Poland has got any Chinese cultural connections at all since uh, Poland was not present in China alongside other Western powers in the 18th, 19th, and in the beginning of the 20th century? Back then, there was even no Poland on the map of the world. But, uh, and here's the surprising fact, although there was no Polish state, there were still Polish people and those cultural connections, somehow those collections somehow found their way to the houses of those Polish people who wanted to feel connected to the bigger, wider world. So this willingness to open up to the wider world, it is what ultimately brought Poland back uh, to, into the ranks of fully independent states. First in 1918, then in 1989, having in their households the collections from many faraway places from all over the world, it played a significant role in shaping this open mind, independent mindset of the Poles when we needed most. Uh, in that way, for myself, today's testimony to connectedness has not been developed in the last few decades. Our people, our cultures, they were even one Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Um, Michaela, shall we start with your paper first? Michaela? Yes, so... Let's start with your paper first. 
Um, I think you, I think you're on mute. Now I can see everything fine. So uh, we will do three papers and then we, we will have a short Q&A session. I'm Mikhaila Pejčochová from Prague and uh, it is a Michaela, just hold on a second. I um, your your sound isn't coming through.
Can yes, you hear yes. me now? Okay, so we'll okay. push back to the public now. Okay. Oh, starts. so my. So I read That's again from the beginning. Yes, I'm so sorry, everybody. Okay, so you can start your presentation now. So uh, I will tell a few, I will say a few words about collecting Chinese art in Central Europe. It will have these few parts about collecting in the Renaissance era. Then we will move on to the aristocratic collections at castles and chateaus and a private collecting of some rich entrepreneurs and art lovers. Then we will move on to the interval period collection of a few travelers who traveled to Asia themselves. And we will finish with the post-war contacts between the countries of the socialist bloc and the establishment of the Asian art collection in Prague in 1951. So first, uh, the collecting and exhibiting of Asian art in Central Europe flourished as part of the aristocratic chambers of curiosities and luxury objects during the 16th and 17th centuries. Collection were, collections were formed uh, not only in coastal countries such as Portugal, Spain, Great Britain, the Netherlands, and, and these uh, big countries, which launched maritime expeditions to Asia and America, but also in the heartland of Europe, which was actually closely related to the Portuguese and Spanish courts by bloodlines and marriages. These oldest collections contained mainly smaller decorative objects made from porcelain and lacquer textiles and also pieces of furniture and a few uh, Chinese paintings also. Uh, parts of these collections are luckily preserved in some places such as uh, the collection of the Ambras Castle in Austria where the earliest documented Chinese paintings are preserved and those are these two beautiful uh, colorful Chinese paintings. Uh, there was also a collection of Asian art in Prague uh, at the court of Rudolf II, which was called Rudolf's uh, Cabinet of, Curi of Curiosities. And these also included uh, painted screens and uh, paintings on paper and silk. They were unfortunately dispersed and lost during the subsequent centuries. Uh, and very few of them survived here in Prague, but luckily, we have, for example, this uh, Japanese lacquered coffer still surviving from Rudolf II's collection in the collection of the Prague Castle now. Now, when we move on to the second stage, another uh, crucial period for the collecting of Asian art in Central Europe was that of the aristocratic and entrepreneurial century until the end of the Second World War, when, collect, uh, when collections were formed in numerous local castles, villas, or chateaus. These were often assembled in a more informed way than their predecessors, and this also sometimes resulted from the collector's travels to Asia. At this time, private collecting of Asian art flourished, especially, again, Japanese porcelain, Chinese porcelain, lacquer, and textiles, and most notably, in regions uh, with strong industrial tradition, uh, there were local industrial museums set up, such as this one in Pilsen, which also collected Asian art, and some of them uh, still continue to house significant collections of Asian art. Private collections, however, were also assembled in numerous places, which represented their owners' tastes and interests. For example, Heinrich Schicht, founded a successful chemical plant in Northern Bohemia and accumulated a fortune, which he invested in building a luxurious villa and decorating it with artworks. His wife traveled around the world with her maid and wrote a book about it, from which art and culture very much. From Schicht's collection, for example, this incense burner and a few other objects are presently preserved in the National Gallery in Prague. Another example would be uh, Fritz Lev Boer, who lived in Moravia, and who was especially interested in Chinese lacquer, which he, brought, which he bought through his Beijing-based delegates. 
here you can see uh, this famous lacquer throne or here also he bought very uh, luxurious lacquer pieces which he however sold already before the second world war in an international auction so these pieces are not preserved in czech collections anymore but number of them are now in the linden museum in stuttgart and some of them also in the museum of asian art in berlin now let's move on to the next stage which is the interval period collecting uh, the collecting of chinese art uh, in former czechoslovakia reached one of its peaks during this period and collectors and lo art lovers uh, already uh, could find ways how to get to Asia, how to live in Asia long term. And subsequently, they were much better acquainted with the local collections and art scene. And they basically much more uh, understood what was going on in China and Japan. The three most important collectors, you can see their names here, were Josef Martinek, Joe Hlocha and Wojciech Chytil. Josef Martinek uh, began to collect art while he was employed uh, by the British Maritime Customs in Wuhu and Tientin. And he had opportunities uh, to acquire the pieces during the custom procedures. He specialized in ancient Chinese art, but also uh, Buddhist art and ancient Chinese paintings. So he brought to the Czech Republic, of former Czechoslovakia, numerous pieces of ancient Chinese art, of which quite a few are nowadays, again, in the collection of the National Gallery in Prague. Another significant collector was uh, Joe Hlocha, a writer of sentimental and exotic novels who traveled to Japan and collected mostly Buddhist art, woodblock prints, paintings, and applied art objects from Japan, as well as paintings uh, and tomb figurines from China, which you can see here as a decoration for his apartment, one of his, one of his former apartments. After his return to Czechoslovakia, he operated as a private dealer and sold numerous objects from his collection, organizing exhibitions and supplying public and private collections. A few Chinese and numerous Japanese objects ended up uh, in the collection of the National Gallery Prague, such as, for example, two very rare battle paintings from the Qing Dynasty, of which I am showing one at the moment. So this was Joe Hlocha's uh, collection. Then the third was Wojciech Chytil, who went to China in 1918, and he was an academically trained painter he established a career of a professional painter and teacher of Western painting in Beijing. And he was actually personally acquainted with the painter Qi Bai Shi and also other um, painters or other modern Chinese ink painters in Beijing. And Kitiel fell in love with Qi Bai Shi's works. He tried to collect as many of them as possible. And then uh, he really acquired a collection of at least 100 of Chi Paishu's masterpieces, which he brought to Europe and exhibited around the central Europe, not only in Prague, but also in those other cities like Vienna, Budapest, uh, Bratislava, or Berlin. So he was the one who introduced Chi Paishu around central Europe for the first time. Later, uh, Hitil's unique collection of modern Chinese painting was inherited by the National Gallery in Prague after the death of Hitil's wife in the early 1980s, and it forms the base of one of the most important modern Chinese painting collections in the West. And you can read more about it in my book, uh, Emissary from the Far East, which I published two years ago. So these were the three most important collectors uh, for the interwar period collecting. And lastly, after the Second World War, a highly specific situation arose, as we all know, after the communist takeover in a number of, uh, of countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And despite the general deterioration of life conditions here in the spheres of political, economic, social, or cultural life, there were paradoxically more opportunities for cross-cultural cross exchanges and influences within these uh, 
countries or uh, among these countries of the socialist bloc. Unparalleled conditions thus appeared for collecting Chinese artworks in the countries of the so-called Eastern Bloc, such as Czechoslovakia, German Democratic Republic, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, and so on. Uh, also Hungary, of course, with uh, the People's Republic of China. Czechoslovakia had a strong tradition of contacts with Chinese scholars, writers, artists, and other specialists since the interwar period. And these also contributed significantly to the establishing of the good relationships. And later in 1951, to the establishment of the Department of Oriental Art at today's National Gallery in Prague. In the era of the friendly contacts with the People's Republic of China, the building of the Chinese art collection became uh, one of the crucial tasks of this newly established uh, Department of Asian Art. And a number of official trips were undertaken for the purpose of study and negotiating projects with Chinese colleagues. For example, the Director General of the National Gallery, whom you can see here, he was called Vladimir Novotny. So he personally visited China as part of the delegation of Czech and Slovak cult cultural workers invited in the autumn of 1953. After his return to Prague, uh, he brought back modern Chinese ink paintings uh, of those official artists or those who were presented to the Czech specialist, such as you can see here again, Chi Pai Shi, or also Li Keran, Wu Duoren, Tiang Zhao He, and others of these, uh, of these official artists and a number of new possibilities for building the collection of Chinese art in Prague arose during the 1950s and early 1960s when friendly relations with the People's Republic of China flourished. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions after, after our presentations. I will try to stop sharing now. And I hope everybody can hear me now. And I would like to pass on to Georgi Fajczak to present uh, the Hungarian collector, sinologist and collector Miklos Pál. Please, Georgi. Thank you very much, Michaela. Um, good evening, everybody. And first of all, I would like to uh, say thanks to um, Yifan Lee and uh, Michaela Pechehova uh, to edit uh, and to organize um, this uh, event and this special issue of the um, orientations uh, uh, magazine, um, because I think um, this is the first uh, um, <clears throat> time when uh, such kind of uh, um, special uh, issue uh, will be um, <clears throat> published in this uh, uh, magazine. Um, <clears throat> and um, now I would like to um, speak um, about um, <clears throat> Miklós Pál, um, who was uh, a unique Hungarian uh, sinologist and um, <clears throat> He was uh, a very strong contact with um, Chinese contemporary artists in the early 1950s. I would like to start with uh, a full screen panel. Well, um, the famous Hungarian um, sinologist Mipayer um, was deeply interested and uh, uh, <clears throat> closely connected to modern Chinese visual arts, literature, um, and yet um, my paper and um, <clears throat> this presentation um, focus on an unknown but important aspect of his interest and presence, his connections um, with contemporary Chinese painters in the early 1950s, when he studied in the People's Republic of China. 
He graduated as a French and Hungarian teacher from the Peter Hasman University. This is the present um, day Petrushoran University in Budapest. Uh, and he graduated in 1950 and arrived in China in September 1951. He was trained in an intensive language course at uh, Beijing University from October um, 1951 and started to study the history of Chinese literature a year later. He officially became a student of art history at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing on 5th March, 1953. Um, <clears throat> professor Wang Xun, a well-known and highly respected professor of Chinese art, uh, art history was assigned to be his supervisor. Documents at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing from 1953 show that uh, Miklos investigated three art teams, general survey of the history of art in China, the sculpture of uh, Yunkang and the Lungmen cave temples, and uh, <clears throat> The third um, uh, theme was uh, the art of Tunhuang. His basic study was the course led by uh, Professor Wang Xun and uh, his main subjects were such as uh, follows. The first Tunhuang and the beginning of painting. Second one, sculptures of Yunkang and the Lungmen cave temples. The third one, landscapes in the Sung period. The fourth, bird and flower painting in the Sung period, the fifth illustrations and woodblock prints, the sixth the art of porcelains, and um, the last, the seventh, the general survey of applied arts. It was in the academic year 1953-54 that Paul Miklos started to study the contemporary arts of China, especially the new graphic arts. This subject would become the topic of his uh, thesis entitled The Art of Contemporary Woodblock Prints in China, written in Chinese, as uh, he was completing his, um, his studies in China. You can see that Pa Miklos, to deal with modern Chinese pictorial art in the fall of 1953, on the one hand, the subject was closely related to his thesis at the Central Academy of Fine Arts, as he had to deepen his knowledge in the field of modern Chinese painting. On the other hand, he was also trying to collect as much information as possible because of uh, the lack of reference literature on art history, especially on contemporary art and artists. His basic material consisted of interviews and oral information given by teachers, artists, and students of the academy. From December 1953 to June 1954, he met and talked with more than 30 artists. These interviews and the associated data also formed the basis of his PhD thesis after returning from China to Hungary. The acquaintances, conversation partners, and the social networks of Palme Kloch provide us with the outline of a very special circle of modern Chinese artists. Miklos met all of the most significant artists of uh, Chinese painting during uh, the course of his data collection. He examined and greatly admired the works of these artists and they furnished with, uh, him with perfect references for presenting the main trends and schools of contemporary Chinese art. His first crucial meeting probably took place as early as May 1953. The journey to the Yunkan cave temples was led by the painter Li Kezhan from the Academy of um, <clears throat> fine art, who was close to the circle of Lingfemian in the 1930s. These artists represented the new cosmopolitan Chinese painting and their works were fusions of Chinese traditional and modern subjects that uh, successfully combine Eastern and Western techniques of painting. Li Kezhan was known as one of the reformers of Chinese landscape painting who gave Zhen new impetus. 
recurring subject of his was a boy playing a flute inside a water buffalo, which he depicted in varied compositions. This figure suggests Vernon Chan parable and the kind and gentle figures of the story accompanied uh, Li Zhang throughout his career. Miklos even had one of his paintings, um, The Mountain Beholder, as you can see on this slide, at his home. Ah, Miklos visited Wu Zhen and his wife Xiao Shufang in their home in Beijing on 5th March 1954. Wu Tozhen first began his career in Shanghai following the advice of his professor Su Pei Hung. He went to Europe in 1929 to study painting in Paris, Ecole des Beaux Arts, and Brussels, Academie Royale de Beige. He returned to China in 1935 and began teaching together with Su Pei Hung at Central University in Nanjing. After the Japanese occupation, the university moved to Chongqing in West China, and Wu Zhen and his family followed. Wu Zhen, meanwhile, made mainly anti-Japanese propaganda pictures at the time. After his wife died in late 1939, and Wu started to wander, he spent a substantial period of time in Qinghai province in the early 1940s, and then lived in Tibet, where he visited the Dunhuang Mopao Caves and system of temples known as the Southern Buddha's Caves. New subjects appeared in his paintings, such as Western Chinese landscapes and minorities, as well as the characteristic animals of this region, yaks, camels. His monochrome ink paintings are distinguished by a deep anatomical knowledge and lovely spontaneous brush strokes. Paul Miklos also had a painting by Wu Zhen, which the start with the art is dedicated to him. And he often illustrated his lectures with this uh, special favorite painting, as you can see. Wu Zhen not only served as an important link to the circle of Su Pei Hung, he was also a significant link for another reason. He talked about the cultural life and movement of Shanghai in the 1930s and popularized the activity of the private school, Shanghai Art University, Shanghai Yishu Taxie, and its successor, the South China University of Arts, the Nanko Yishu Taxie. The main significance of this school was in the way it shaped modern Chinese literature, although the Department of Fine Arts uh, was headed by Xu Pei Hung for a while. Um, <clears throat> Under the influence of Wu Zhen, Pai Miklos paid special attention to the works of Su Pei Hung and his students. This also stemmed from the fact that Su Pei Hung and his students played a significant role in the life of the Beijing Academy of Art. Till his death in September 1953, Xu was the president of the academy and his students had important positions. Furthermore, Xu Pei Hung and his students formed a direct link to the history of art in China in the 1930s. After 1927, Xu was head of the Department of Fine Art at South China University of the Arts in Shanghai, and he was later appointed dean of the Central um, university in Nanjing. After the university moved from Nanjing to Chongqing in 1937, this institution ensured the continuity of high-level Chinese art education until the restart of the Beijing Academy of Fine Arts and the Hangzhou Academy of Fine Arts after 1949. Several artists who moved to Sichuan had significant contacts with Yan'an, the general headquarters of the Chinese Communist Party at that time, and they followed the art policy of the Chinese Communist Party in their works. The activity and works of Su Pei Hung were originally bound to the renewal of Chinese figurative painting. His focus was that Chinese pictorial art had to be renewed from the realism of the Tang period. His students, including um, Chiang Chaohe, Li Hu, and uh, Tong Ti Xiang, were important interviewers of Pai Miklos. Chiang Chaohe talked to him about his pictures upon their meeting in May 1954 and also presented a delicate work to Miklos, a depiction um, 
of a child. Pai Miklos journey to Eastern and Southern China in the spring of 1954, gave him a unique opportunity to meet contemporary artists. He left Beijing on 6 April um, 1954 and traveled together with one of his sculptor fellows. This route took them to Nanjing, Shanghai, and Hangzhou. At the former home in Shanghai of the writer Lu Xun, Miklos made a list of his woodblock prints and these notes served as material for his um, thesis. At the Hangzhou Academy of Fine Arts, he met painters like uh, Mo Pu and uh, Zhang Yanxi. Furthermore, on 17th April 1954, he conducted two important interviews with the legendary artist Han Tianshou and Huan Pinghong. Han Tianshou studied at the Hangzhou Academy of Fine Arts and later became its head when he was appointed by the Kuomintang government. His bird and flower paintings are highlights of the 20th century Chinese painting characterized by the bold compositions. The other painting genus was Huan Pinghong, who received Miklos at his apartment. He became famous for his landscapes. The concretization of the landscape was a feature of the Lingnan School launched in the 1920s by the Cao brothers in Canton, of which uh, he was a proponent. Huang Pinghong wandered around China and discovered real Chinese landscapes in all their richness and diversity. He depicted not the idyllic beauty that traditional Chinese painters sought and visualized, instead a new kind of probing, exploring spirit could be experienced in his landscapes. He innovated uh, with new elements and uh, lovely details in the landscape, such as groups of waterfall or houses. In his revolutionary use of colors, for example, the depicted atmosphere, he completely transformed the traditional Chinese landscape composition. Pai Miklos was again favored receiving a scroll painted uh, by Huang, as you can see in the slide. In April 1954, Pai Miklos and his companion traveled uh, from Hangzhou to, uh, to uh, Guangdong. Um, he met with uh, craftsmen, but uh, there is no record of him meeting any Chinese painters there. Returning to Beijing, they stopped in Wuhan, where Miklos met some famous wandering painters um, of 1940s. Li Xiongcai and Quan Shanyue were among the first to depict Western China in their paintings. Here you can see a sketch of Li Xiongcai, which was depicted a monastery near Dunhuang. The master dedicated it to uh, Pai Miklos, who also traveled to Dunhuang uh, in August uh, 1953. Miklos worked um, according to a strict schedule issued by his supervisor Wang Xun and made sketches of uh, uh, 42 cave temples. After returning Hungary, he published a book, The Cave Temples of 1000 Buddhas at Dunhuang in 1959. After arriving in Beijing, Pai Miklos worked on his thesis on modern Chinese woodblock prints, which he completed in June 1954. The manuscript has not survived, but it's known that the data were checked by such masters as uh, Chen Shuliang, Xu Xinzhi, and Li Qin, all artists in the circle of uh, Yan'an woodblock printmakers. Significant parts of this uh, thesis were incorporated into his PhD thesis, which covered a broader theme focusing not only on contemporary Chinese woodblock printmakers, but also on contemporary Chinese painters and schools of painters. This manuscript is available in Hungarian. In addition to these interviews, Pai Miklos had other opportunities to meet Chinese artists while working as an interpreter in China and guiding Hungarian artists on the Chinese tour, according to reports he made from China at the time now archived in Hungary. I suppose he met Chi Pai Shi in this way. He accompanied the Hungarian artist to visit the master, at which time he also took some photos. He greatly appreciated the art of Chi Pai Shi. His deep attachment is evidenced by his monograph of Chi Pai Shi published in 1952 and um, by his favorite album leaf entitled 
autumn uh, by the great master, which uh, uh, hung in the wall of his uh, study room. Um, <clears throat> as um, analysis of the meetings and interviews Pai Miklos conducted with Chinese artists reveals that most of these occasions were proposed by his professors and teachers at the academy. From these names, we can confirm that the Chinese art world clearly knew its great masters and significant artists. Miklos had a unique opportunity to meet painters who are still considered among the most significant masters of the 20th century Chinese art. He meanwhile was worthy of their trust since his knowledge and determined effort um, were recognized by his teachers. As a summary of his Chinese studies, Miklos Pal uh, wrote his PhD thesis on the history of Chinese painting in the first half of the 20th century. As a pioneering endeavor, it relied on important fieldwork and personal meetings. He collected data on 150 contemporary artists, of whom 100 were painters and 50 were woodblock printmakers. He later expanded his database with information on a further 300 Chinese artists. His um, PhD thesis completed in 1956 was an important attempt to summarize the history of 20th century Chinese art. It was unique for both its subject matter and its author's uh, working method. In his later work, Miklos uh, made intensive use of all this knowledge, firmly establishing his very special place in the history of Hungarian Sinology. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Georgie, very much for this rich presentation of Paul Miklos' contacts and, and the paintings he collected. This is really very interesting example parallel to those Prague collections as well. So we can discuss this later on in the uh, in the discussion part. And now I would like to pass on to Isabella Kopania, who is a Polish specialist on collecting Chinese art in Poland. And she will tell us something about uh, the Chinese taste at the Eastern borders of Europe from the 1696 to 1821. Isabella, please. Um, hello, um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be a part of this wonderful project. And just straight to the point, um, the second half of the 17th century saw the beginning of fashion for Chinese objects and fascination with the faraway Middle Kingdom in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. A federation of the Kingdom of Poland and the Duchy of Lithuania, a state of considerably different borders and area than contemporary Poland. Now lost Chinese closet arranged in 1680s at Wielanów Palace in Warsaw for King Jan III was one of the earliest manifestations of the craze for China. Since then, Chinese taste constituted an inherent part of Polish aristocratic culture long into 19th century when it gave its way to Japanese. The inventory of Villanov Palace, registered after the death of King Jan III, featured numerous objects referred to as Chinese. As none of these objects is preserved, it is difficult to judge on their provenance, whether they were Chinese imports or European chinoiserie goods. Our knowledge of how Chinese taste uh, was manifested in the early modern period is informed more by textual sources than material items. What must be mentioned, however, is that Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth never enacted its own East India Company and never traded directly with China. A handful of Polish Jesuits who resided in the Middle Kingdom did not constitute any channel of transfer of knowledge, objects, or images between China and Poland. Chinese fashion was mediated by the West, both in terms of consumption of exotic goods and of the knowledge of China. Under the Wedding House of Saxony in the 18th century, Chinese vogue exploded among Polish nobility as an emulation of French and Saxon patterns. Augustus II the Strong uh, commissioned a lacquered cabinet to be arranged at Villanov Palace 
uh, in Warsaw. Uh, and as early as 1731 or 1732, the royal residence boasted of a fashionable room whose walls were wainscoted with panels decorated with imitation of Japanese lacquer by Martin Schnelle. Wooden panels covered with glittering golden orange red lacquer were decorated with figures of the Chinese and motifs inspired directly by, by East Asian prints from the collection of Augustus the Strong. The panels were given exuberant sculpted framings with leaf head heads at the bottom, eagle-like birds at the top, and frontons, frontons in shape of blue and white porcelain vase. Uh, the cabinet is the only interior created in Saxon times that has been preserved an, until these days. Archival sources, however, testify to an extensive spread of decoration in Chinese style at that time. It is documented that Schnell accepted commissions from Polish gentry and Mason porcelain vessels served as gifts sent by the Saxon court. This contributed to, to promulgating Chinese vogue among the Polish nobility. Even though Stanislaus Augustus, the last king of Poland, was not any avid collector of Chinese objects, for a short time, uh, Chinese style found its place in King's summer residence, the Łazienki Park outside Warsaw. In mid 1770s, as extensive works were undertaken in the Royal Garden. The most exceptional construction, which gave the whole garden a Chinese flavor, was situated in its very heart between a bathhouse, Łazienka, which served as a palace, and the White Pavilion, which was a less formal Maison de Plaisance. The two buildings were connected via ro Royal Promenade, the focal point of which was Chinese Gate. Designed by Jan Christian Kamsetzer, the promenade was laid out between two canals running along the hall. Wooden trellises entwined by shrubs of acacia were erected along both sides of the road. Chinese gate took the form of a bower placed on high pillars. It was described in royal residence inventory as in Chinese gate. The roofs covering the stairs and the, bow the bower were made of tin painted green to resemble carp scales and gilded. The idea of the Chinese gate and the promenade is documented by numerous drawings by Kamsetzer, who employed a range of motifs associated with Chinese imagery. To give this complex a sense of visual unity, a Chinese style galleries covered with Chinese roofs, constructed of dozens uh, of tin cupolas painted green, were added to both the building of Wazienka and White Pavilion. The complex was demolished in the late 1780s, and the Chinese gate was lucky to survive, to survive slightly later until 1825. And of the Chinese style interiors in Wazienki pavilions, only one survives today, the drawing room in the White Pavilion. Uh, Chinese wallpapers were installed there in 1775, when the interiors of the newly erected suburban villa were completed. On the northern wall, there is a painting on textile representing a view of European and Chinese factories in Canton. One may observe that at the time when the painting was produced, the Danish, Danish, French, Swedish, British and Dutch quarters were occupied. It seems that the image owned by the Warsaw Court mirrors the reality of the web factories around 1772. The wall covering is unique in terms of both composition and use. Among many images of Canton factories preserved in various collections, this one has unparalleled diagonal composition. Moreover, while Canton homes were popular as a decoration of porcelain vessels, they were very rarely included in the decorated right. schemes of wallpapers. A huge re representations, representation of Hongs in the landscape, known as Drummond wallpaper, now in the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, is a comparable item. As the latter shows the waterfront between uh, 1800 and 1803, it appears that the painting in the White Pavilion is now the earliest known example of such wall covering. The western wall of the, of the drawing room is decorated with a painting on paper showing dwellings and daily business of the Chinese, while the third wall, the eastern one, is adorned with an oil painting by the court artist Jan Bogumplersch, much inspired by the, by the scene nearby. 
the whole Prev European training is visible. He was very skillful in imitating figures and objects depicted by a Chinese artist craftsman. Plerf was also responsible for adjusting Chinese wallpapers to the spaces designed for them. In both cases, he painted the parts of sky, ground, and architecture to make the panna complete. Registers of the White Pavilion mentioned there some Chinese objects and four sconces whose main body consisted of porcelain vases ordered in Meissen. Uh, the Canton Factory's view in White Pavilion found its more interesting counterpart in the palace. In the King's study in Wazienka, there was a panoramic wallpaper installed there in 1777, representing a broad view of the Pearl River Delta, including Canton homes and the most representative buildings like the Flowery Pagoda and the French Folly Fort. Uh, the panoramic view has few counterparts in European collections, including a splendid uh, painting on silk produced around 1771, now in the collection of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Uh, even though sources are silent on wallpaper's provenance, one may presume their British origins. It is known that Stanislaus Augustus arranged some commissions and purchases in England through Th Thomas Rotten and his brother, L Lord Edward Montagu, both well acquainted with Chinese export markets. Uh, an exceptional Chinese room was arranged in Wentzot Castle for the Princess Isabella Lubomirska, a wealthy woman of powerful family connections. She shared her time between Paris, Vienna and Wandswood, where the new Chinese apartment was installed between the years 1791 and 1802. Uh, the apartment comprises two rooms, the Pompeian drawing room and the Chinese bedroom. The arrangement of the walls in both spaces was subordinated to the prints and uh, drawings displayed. In the Pompeian drawing rooms, room, these were prints and watercolors representing antique subjects, and in the Chinese bedroom, uh, these were watercolor drawings of Chinese pavilions, bowers, and interiors of houses, as well as what gouaches featuring children with uh, play, uh, playthings and the New, new Year work, New Year woodblock, woodblock prints. Uh, the drawings representing architecture and interiors call for a special comment due to their iconography and origins. Representations of Chinese pavilions, interiors, and bowers are far from, are far from the typical export paintings market. Instead, every image from Wanzhou finds its counterpart in the pictorial treatise on architecture, Essay sur l'architecture chinoise, uh, produced in Beijing in uh, circa 1773 and sent by Jesuits to Henri Bertin, a secretary of state to Louis Camps. Uh, the ones that images are not the exact, exact copies and numerous discrepancies betray a hand of a European artist. The Chinese characters are clumsy, monochromatic paintings are replaced with compositions in colors, and the coloring of particular motifs is not faithful either. The 1802 palace inventory terms the drawings antiquities, exactly the same as the images uh, in Bertin's studio record. Uh, the wanted drawings must have been produced on the spot in Paris at, at Bertin's studio, which was accessible to everyone who wanted to conduct research there. Uh, here, um, it is possible that Isabella Lubomirska commissioned the drawings during one of her stays in Paris as she visited the city very regularly between 1786 and 1789, and she hired apartment in Palais Royal. And of course, she was very familiar with the uh, French elite, especially prim prim Princess of Lampal, the closest friend of Marie Antoinette. Uh, and here, the agency of uh, the drawings should be stressed as they served as a drive for creating the whole interior. In the Chinese bedroom, the motifs of wallpaper were directly inspired by the elements featured on architect architectural drawings. Chinese characters, cloud-like motifs, and floral compositions in pots. The wallpaper produced on the spot in Wantu was designed as a background to exhibit the drawings, as suggested by six rectang rectangular frames prepared as exposition spaces. It constitutes a decorative scheme that links images into a coherent system. The way it was composed seem seems to mimic, to some extent, the interiors portrayed by a Chinese and subsequently by a Euro European artist. Ornamental motifs, 
which I usually refuse to do, convey any significant meanings, mediated here the encounter between the drawings which connoted China and their European owners. Uh, Stanisław Kostka-Potocki, uh, Lubomirska's son-in-law, shared her admiration for things Chinese. His interest, however, manifested itself in a different way. Potocki was an active politician, a well-educated man, uh, interested in art, archaeology, and language. His multiple interests resulted in an extraordinary collection of European paintings and prints, Roman antiquities, Etruscan vases, and Chinese objects. In 1805, Potocki made his collections available to the public. A suite of Chinese rooms he commissioned, he commissioned at Villanov Palace was designed as an expositional place as well. The first mention of its existence in sources dates to 1813, even though the furnishings of the suit was broken by Potocki's death in 1821, it did not mark the end of collecting. Both his wife and his son continued assembling Chinese objects. The now destroyed suit consisted of six spaces, a vestibule, two small closets, and three rooms. The first Chinese room, the second middle room, and the third, and the third Chinese room. The walls of subsequent um, uh, rooms were decorated with Chinese prints and watercolors, uh, painted woodcuts representing flowery sprigs, portraits of Chinese ladies stemming from the tradition of pictures showing beautiful courtesans and Nianhua woodblock prints produced in the Daivian Cheng workshop in the, town, in the town of Yanglin Tsing. In every case, local artists produced, uh, adorned the walls in such a way that the decorations constituted frames for images and a background for the presentation of collectibles. The collection of Chinese objects initiated by Potocki was unique in the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was a diversified set of objects covering as many spheres of Chinese culture and life as possible. It included not only pieces of fine and decorative art, but also items that would now better fit in the realm of ethnography, such as slippers, umbrellas, and straw hats. Potocki's collection uh, constituted an important field of his research. He penned one on the first comprehensive accounts of Chinese art. It was published in 1815 as an autonomous chapter in his adaptation from the French of Johann, v Johann Winkelmann's History of the Art of Antiquity. What seems important in Potocki's case is that his chapter on the art among the Chinese constituted part of the narrative on the arts, not an overall description of China. He included Chinese art into the description of the legacy of antiquity. Interestingly, he based his observations on contemporary art and drew information from travel diaries, Jesuit writings, and his own collection of Chinese items. Accounts of such objects as carvings betray an eye of an observer. Potocki's account of Chinese art must be, must be understood within the network of changing attitudes and expanding knowledge uh, of Chinese art, as well as, the, as in the context of the stories of deeply rooted stereotypical image of the Middle Kingdom. The last one, especially the, the idea of China as a living image of antiquity, allowed Potocki to include a chapter on Chinese art into the story of the art of Greco-Roman antiquity. Potocki's collection and erudite knowledge of China stayed unrivaled both among his peers and the following generations of Polish collectors of, of Orientalia. And to conclude, uh, art historians often dismissed Chinese fashion in Poland as rather an interesting influence of Western trends on Polish culture. Close reading of archival sources and objects themselves not only reveals unusual items of Europe and China exchange, but also allows to see a trivialized category of fashion as a complex phenomenon in terms of tra translating Chinese idioms into European ones and in terms of rules which governed the, incor the incorporation of non-European heritage into the universe of the Euro European palaces. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabella. This was also a very fascinating talk on the uh, Polish aristocracy is collecting, and I think this is really interesting how this fashion for things Chinese was very much spread around the whole of Europe, because I think it's similar for the nowadays Czech Republic, but also other countries like 
Hungary, Austria, even Switzerland. I saw some presentation of these castles and villas and they have all these similar prints and paintings pasted on the walls, maybe even from the same consignments brought to Europe. So this is really very, very valuable contribution. Thank you very much. And I think we should start the discussion now, if you are fine with it. I have two questions which came through the chat. So I will read the questions and I will ask you and me also to, to answer them. First is, the, first is a question, are there any collections of Asian art that have been formed in more recent times? So I don't know to whom this actually pertains because we all present it from different times, but maybe I can say a few words about the Czech collections and then I will ask you too. So for the Czech uh, museums, we have two collections of Asian art, both in Prague, there is this National Gallery, which I work for, and then there is National Museums collection called uh, the Naprostek Museum, and we all collect until today. So these are also contemporary collections, but of course it's very difficult to buy Chinese art, more and more difficult uh, due to the rising prices of Chinese objects, both ancient and contemporary. So we do what we can, but it's, it's more and more complex. Of course, during those uh, periods when there was this state uh, supported collecting during the communist period, it was much more uh, like smooth or it was possible to get those objects via different ways, not only buying them in, in the free market. So this is the context for the Czechos Czech, Czech collections. And we also have definitely some private collections and these are growing and these depend on their owners possibilities. And they include some ancient and contemporary Chinese art as far as I know, but yeah, this would be a different topic. So this is for the Czech context. Maybe uh, Georgi, if you can answer shortly, yeah, are there um, any collections? Yeah, just a few words about the Hungarian um, aspect. Um, in Hungary, we have uh, only one uh, museum dedicated uh, to the uh, Asian art. Um, it's a state-run um, public collection. I mean, uh, the Ferenc Hope Museum of Asiatic Arts, as uh, Parker is mentioned uh, in the uh, <clears throat> foreword. Um, and uh, we try to collect, but uh, as um, uh, Misha mentioned, um, it's uh, <laughs> rather difficult <laughs> to collect <laughs> contemporary um, items. Um, I would highly appreciate um, to collect contemporary um, items, but um, it's, um, um, it's not easy uh, to get um, these things. And uh, of course, uh, we try to uh, collect um, traditional uh, um, old items as well. Um, in Hungary, we uh, do not have uh, other Asian collections. Some items, some smaller collections uh, can be found um, in other uh, state-run institutions like the uh, Museum of Ethnography in Budapest and um, some, uh, some country museum, but uh, um, they uh, um, haven't got uh, uh, <clears throat> significant uh, material. And uh, nowadays, um, I um, do not know um, about uh, um, private collections um, mm. which are um, dedicated um, to um, especially Chinese art. They are private collectors who collect uh, Asian items, but uh, not only uh, Chinese. That's all what um, I yes. guess. Yeah, that would be quite similar to what we have here. And uh, yeah. Isabella, can you would actually, you answer for the Polish yeah. so situation? Actually, actually, situation is in Poland is is somehow com comparable. We have at least two big collections of Chinese art, which does not mean uh, of contemporary art. We have two collections in Krakow and in Warsaw. In Warsaw, the collection of Chinese art was assembled after the Second World War. So it's, it's just like a contemporary history. And in Krakow, it was initiated at the, in the very early years of the 20th century. And the, another two institutions which are um, important are the Asian Pacific Museum in Warsaw, but they do not focus on Chinese art. They, 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 their collection is devoted rather to 
uh, to um, uh, Southeast Asian art and the famous manga museum of, um, uh, of art in Krakow, which houses the collection of Felix Manga Yashinsky, the renowned collector of Japanese uh, prints. Great, perfect, thank you. So I hope this was, this was, this explained the question. And the second question we have is for Georgie. How has Paul Miklos's connections with Chinese contemporary artists and his studies of their work influenced Hungarian contemporary artists? Uh, thank you for this question. It's it's very interesting. Uh, Miklos Pal has um, um, had great influence uh, in this field because, um, um, as I mentioned, uh, he um, um, wrote uh, several uh, books, monographs uh, on uh, Chinese uh, painters and especially on uh, Chinese painting, um, and um, um, he had. Um, um, very special positions in the Hungarian cultural life in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, for example, he was the uh, director of the Museum of Applied Art, and um, he had very strong contact with contemporary Hungarian artists um, who was uh, influenced and uh, um, tagged by uh, Chinese uh, um, writing. Um, and um, there uh, was a special, uh, I can say, circle of Hungarian uh, artists uh, who were the calligraphists. Uh, of the uh, contemporary Hungarian painters. Um, and um, Miklós Pál opened several, several uh, exhibitions uh, um, of those artists uh, who um, were influenced by um, Chinese uh, art. So um, I think he had a very, very great impact um, on uh, Hungarian um, contemporary art. Great, thank you. So another question is for Isabella, and this is your presentation gave insight into the aristocratic perception of China at that time. What, in your view, is the general idea of China now? Well, oh, well, <laughs> I'm not a sociologist, but I, I just yeah. try to do my best. Well, actually, now China is better and better known in Poland, because as you probably know, the tradition of Chinese studies in Poland is a rather young tradition. It's not the, the very old one dating back to the to the 18th century or, or 19th century. And there's more and more possibility to um, enroll uh, in Chinese studies. So um, what's the general idea of China now? It, it's a difficult question. I know that now a lot of Polish students of uh, art history are very interested in contemporary Polish uh, Chinese art. And uh, several years ago, we had a huge exhibition of, of uh, contemporary Chinese art in uh, the, the Zachenta, uh, Zachenta Gallery in Warsaw. And I think that, that China is not that far away country that it used to be in the period uh, which was covered in my talk, but I think that still it's it's a country which many, many people want to uh, just get, get to know. It's just interesting, curious, maybe not that curious and as, as uh, hundreds of years ago, but but still I think in, in, in opinion of numerous Poles, young Poles, very worth visiting and discovering. Oh, That's what yeah, I would yeah, say. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> wonderful. Great, thank you. So there are no more questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know about the time. We are maybe running out of time. What do you think, Ivan? Can um, we still discuss or? You, um, if you have any questions amongst yourselves, otherwise we can wrap this up. But um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, uh, on the back of what Isabella said, I think it's really important to talk about these different collections all over the world, especially um, in regions that are probably lesser known to the Asian audience, because I think this is this is you know the, a way to open up um, discussions and and um, connections because the world is quite small. So um, indeed, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, so maybe I have I have one connection or or a remark for George's paper because of course it was very interesting to me to see all these painters featured in the artist's journey and their works uh, collected by Miklos Pal. Did he by chance meet any Czech specialists over there because they were basically doing the same? They were there were several of them studying in China and uh, in Beijing, but also traveling to those other places, uh, also to Sichuan during the war or later they were at those universities. Did he by chance have, have any contacts with other Europeans and perhaps also Czechs? Um, there were uh, not so many Europeans at the time from the um, Soviet uh, countries, I mean, from uh, Czechoslovakia, yeah. from Poland, from uh, Romania. Of course, uh, there were several students at the time in uh, China, especially in Beijing. Um, but um, I know um, one name, Josef Heislar. Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought. Very, very well known uh, uh, sinologist. He was uh, um, a um, fellow of uh, Almi Kloch at the time, and uh, they had a very um, uh, strong contact. Um, oh, uh, oh. So um, they um, have um, uh, correspondence, um, and um, uh, they were very familiar um, with each other. So uh, I think uh, Josef Heisler uh, also wrote uh, a book on Chi uh, Pai Shi later. And, uh, yeah, yes, he did. Several, because... several years later. So uh, it was uh, on the same way. As it was in the same uh, trend. Um, we can realize uh, what they studied uh, in the 1950s. Uh, they uh, tried to follow in the 1960s and 70s. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, it was totally parallel, I think. He was also interested in those similar similar topics, not so much maybe in the cave temples, but definitely in Chibaishi and work of those other artists. So I'm happy you have this correspondence because I didn't know about this contact. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So are there a lot of um, uh, specialists or scholars from the region in, in China and Asia now? Not just China, but of course Japan and in the Far East, are, are there a lot of scholars there doing doing research, current research now? Um, uh, yeah, me, Isha. No, please. you go first, please, please. Please, please. So, okay, for Czech, uh, for Czech Republic, it's like uh, we have a few. We don't have many specialists in Chinese, Japanese, Korean art. We have more like people interested in history, literature, and those other fields. But I believe this is also our duty to 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 raise this awareness of Chinese collections and to as, as curators and specialists and to actually show them what we have, because maybe those students are not so well encouraged here also, I think, because we don't have a chair, for example, for Chinese art studies or Japanese or Asian art studies at all. We have only these general fields like sinology, Japanese studies, Korean studies, and they don't maybe come across this possibility. So there, there are quite few, to be honest. But we want to definitely want, want to have more students and, and promote this as much as possible. Yes, and in Hungary and Poland, please. Well, um, in Hungary, um, um, of course, uh, we don't have special um, faculties dedicated to uh, um, Asian arts. Um, we have uh, <clears throat> the special um, uh, subjects like, like um, sinology, uh, um, Indologists, um, Koreanists, etc. So um, <clears throat> if uh, somebody um, would like to uh, study um, art history of uh, Asia, especially China, um, have to go um, abroad. Uh, <clears throat> and um, um, he or she can uh, follow uh, his studies there. Um, but um, I think we have a very, very important uh, um, um, task uh, to uh, investigate the cultural and uh, artistic relations um, of these countries, especially we had um, a, a large scale exhibition in um, 2018 um, about the Shanghai um, 
relations. Uh, we try to investigate uh, all of the uh, Hungarian artists and uh, travelers and uh, um, antique dealers who uh, lived in Shanghai, especially um, in the late 19th century and between the two world war. And uh, we published a, a huge monograph. Uh, and it was uh, um, uh, a very uh, um, interesting work for me uh, because uh, it was um, hardly believed that uh, so many Hungarians lived there and uh, uh, left significant uh, um, uh, <clears throat> heritage um, for us um, about uh, Shanghai and about uh, the um, special um, <clears throat> uh, period of their of the life when they lived there, when they uh, had um, activities there. So I think we have uh, many, uh, many new fields, um, uh, not only um, in China, um, because we are a, a museum dedicated to um, whole Asia, but um, um, in the case of China, we have uh, a lot of others uh, thing we, we would like to uh, follow, we would like to continue. Isabella, would you like to uh, yeah. add? To well, um, Georgie, I saw your exhibition in 2018 when I was in Budapest and it was really fascinating. And as far as the Polish context is, con is concerned, the situation is quite similar to what you have in Hungary and in, uh, and in Czech Republic. Because actually we, we have a series of lectures devoted to Chinese or generally to Asian art uh, within, for example, art history studies or uh, sinology. So there is still no specialized field or, or just university or art history institute which would focus on studying Chinese or more generally Asian art. So it's a great job to do still. Well, hopefully yeah. that will change. So um, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank all three speakers for taking your time today to give us your wonderful presentations. And so hopefully, we would all be able to travel more easily soon and we all can all come and visit your collections. Thank you. Thank you. And we are Thank coming. You. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ifan, as well. And I'm sorry for my for my disruption with the sound at the beginning. And also welcome everybody to Prague. If anyone can come, just come, give me an email and just come and, and see our collections. That would be a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. So bye bye. I'm, I'm gonna leave. Bye bye.